great to be back here at Meeting on the Mesa. I will make forward-looking statements, and so I direct you to our SEC filings for a discussion of the risks that affect our business. About three years ago, new management took over at Sangamo, and one of the first acts was to change the name to Sangamo Therapeutics. And uh, that reflects our commitment to translating groundbreaking science into genomic medicines that transform patients' lives. We call ourselves a genomic medicine company. We operate across four technology platforms, gene therapy, gene-edited cell therapy, in vivo genome editing, and gene regulation. Each of these is distinct, but there are common aspects to each of them. And now that we're in clinical development, we are gathering new insights quickly in molecular biology and cassette engineering and delivery, especially in the use of our AAB6 vector. And one theme that I want to bring up today is how these insights uh, we're able to translate across multiple parts of our programs and drive them forward. We're most well known for zinc finger nuclease gene editing, represented by the two icons in the middle of this page. But the in vivo genome editing that we've been working on is delivered as gene therapy. And over the years, we became good at gene therapy. And back in 2016, we made the decision to drive forward with our own gene therapy clinical program. We now have several of them. And regarding ZFNs, over the last few years, our technology team, led by Ed Rebar, has optimized zinc finger nucleases for precision, efficiency, and specificity. And the zinc finger protein engineering capability is at the core of our gene regulation platform on the right side of the page that we're taking forward in CNS diseases. So we do gene therapy because it's a tractable opportunity now and it provides value for patients. And also, in doing so, we're learning a lot about AAV6, and that translates directly into uh, paths forward for our in vivo genome editing programs. We also do ex vivo gene edited cell therapy. This is the most straightforward application of gene editing. You take the cells out of the body, and in a controlled environment, edit them, QC them, sort them, put them back into the patient. And gene therapy and cell therapy, we think, are just steps towards in vivo genome editing and gene regulation. And we think this is the future of genomic medicine. We think this is what patients want, a single IV infusion with the potential to deliver lifelong benefit. We think they'd much prefer that to apheresis, conditioning, and uh, 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 the other complications of some of the other therapies. And over the last three years, we've diversified our portfolio. So we now have a balance of near-term, lower-risk projects in gene therapy and also more technically adventurous aspects of uh, the in vivo work. And here's a look at our pipeline where you can clearly see our partnerships with Pfizer, with Sanofi, with Kite, and with Takeda. And we're often asked, are you a platform company or a product company? And the answer is yes, we're both. We will take products forward ourselves, but where we don't have the bandwidth, we will continue to partner. And partnerships bring more than just cash. Sangamo is famous for technology, but technology is only part of a product. We also need biology, clinical science, therapeutic area leadership, and commercial pull through. And that's what partnerships bring. So I'm going to show a little bit of data, and I'm going to talk about what we've learned and how we're using it to drive certain products forward, but also to advance other parts of our pipeline. This is the dashboard for our SB525 program for hemophilia A. This is partnered with Pfizer. We've enrolled 11 subjects into this study, five at the highest, 313 dose. We showed a little bit of data at ISTH back in July, and I'm going to show you some of those, uh, and we'll have some more data towards year end. So here's what we showed at ISTH, and I want you to focus at first on the logarithmic scale on the right side of the page, and I want to point out three things. The first is the very rapid rise in factor eight expression, and the second is the tight intracohort uh, expression, and then the third is that for the 
the lower dose cohorts where there's been some longer duration of follow-up, you can see that there is no loss of expression, and that's important. And now I want to train your eyes over to the linear scale on the left. And this is a really important observation that we've been able to make here. As you move from 1 E13 to 3 E13 with AAV6, there's a very significant increase in expression. So we see a threshold effect here, and that's a critical observation, not just for this program, but also for our follow-on gene therapy programs like Fabry disease. And really importantly, it also gives us a path forward for our in vivo genome editing programs. Remember, all of those use AAV6. And so again, here's the, the fourth cohort at 3E13. Rapid rise of expression, tight uh, variability. And then I would also point out that around week 15, there's a stabilization of effect. And durability is going to be critical to this product category. And until we've got longer term follow up, we don't have bragging rights. But what we see right now, we like a lot. What patients care about is outcomes. And there have been no bleeding episodes and almost complete elimination of factor replacement use. We're encouraged by these data. Our partner Pfizer is also encouraged. They recently posted to clinicaltrials.gov a uh, protocol for a lead-in study for the phase three registrational trial. And uh, we look forward to working with them as we drive this product forward through phase three to registration. The safety experience has been good. There's one, been one experience to note, an SAE and one patient. Uh, of, it was a hypotension event. It occurred on the, the day of dosing, and uh, the investigator caught it quickly and treated the patient with fluids, acetaminophen, and antihistamine, and the patient was released from the hospital the very next day on schedule. We now pre-treat patients prior to administration. Now, as I said, we're learning uh, as we gather clinical data, and what we're seeing in the, uh, the earlier trials informs later trials. Our next gene therapy is ST920 for Fabry disease. The IND is approved, sites are activated. We expect to dose a patient in this clinical trial very soon. On the bottom there, you see the preclinical data that was foundational for this program. At the high dose, we've got nearly a thousand-fold increase in plasma alpha-gal A activity, and that resulted in very significant uh, reductions in GB3 substrate in uh, organ systems throughout the body. Moving on to ex vivo gene-edited cell therapy, the most advanced program is ST400 for beta thalassemia. This is partnered with Sanofi. There's a related program in sickle cell disease. We've got four patients dosed here. We expect to have six dosed. Uh, and um, uh, we will show some very preliminary data towards the end of the year. I think the main result here is uh, will come after once we've got longer-term follow-up from all of the patients in the study. Last year, we entered into a partnership with Kite to engineer CAR-T, uh, allogeneic CAR-T products. Um, it's a deal that envisions 10 products. The first Kite has announced is an anti-CD19. It's Kite 037, and they expect to initiate a clinical trial for that product in 2020. And the partnership's going very well. We add the editing technology, and then they take it forward from there, and we look forward to continuing to work with them. A key capability required for cell therapy is multiplex editing, and we think we do it very well. These are data that we generated prior to the KITE deal, so this shows four edits in a single step. It's critical that you have high efficiency editing with multiplexing because editing compounds uh, with each edit, or excuse me, efficiency compounds with each edit. And so here we have four edits, each of them with greater than 90% efficiency, and that resulted in 76% of the cells having all four edits. So this is the kind of capability that we bring to the KITE partnership, and it's also a capability that we bring to our own cell therapy product uh, for CAR Tregs, which we're really excited about. So Tregs suppress inflammatory responses. CAR Tregs have the advantage that they can be armed with a CAR that makes them locally activated, and, uh, and antigen activated. You don't need to know the disease-causing antigen to use a CAR-T-RAG. 
at least that's the theory. So for multiple sclerosis, for instance, you don't need to know what causes it. I'm sure it's complicated. But what you do need to know is how do you get to the myelin sheath where you can quell the inflammatory response. And so we think that we can arm uh, a car T-rag in such a way to get there. The first product that we're taking forward is TX200. So this is in the kidney uh, uh, transplant setting for patients who have an HLA-A2 mismatch. And the idea is that infusing them with TX200, that, uh, that the CAR Treg will traffic to the site of the inflammation and calm it. Kidney transplants are great first use for CAR Tregs because these patients are biopsied frequently, so we'll have lots of specimens to examine for the activation of the CAR Treg. Ultimately, we plan to go into in, uh, autoimmune diseases using zinc finger nuclease editing, and hopefully, eventually, also allogeneic. And finally, I want to talk about our uh, CNS platform, which I think is, is overlooked, uh, certainly by the investment community, and it's something that I think people will begin to focus on more and more. Here we use zinc finger protein transcription factors. This, this is gene regulation, not gene editing. So there aren't double-stranded breaks with ZFPTFs. And we can design them for various uses. We can design pan-allelic ZFPTFs that can turn down uh, single genes like tau and alpha-synuclein. We can also design them as allele-selective ZFPTFs that can differentiate the uh, expanded repeat say, of Huntington's disease, um, while leaving the normal allele untouched. And we can do that also with the hexanucleotide repeat of ALS. And then we can also design ZFPTFs for epigenetic activities, like reversing X inactivation. And then also within the CNS domain, we can use zinc finger nuclease gene editing. A group out of Cambridge last year in one of the Nature journals published on high efficiency editing using ZFNs in mitochondria. And that's a spot where CRISPR can't go. So that could be ours alone. And then finally, we can create CAR Tregs for neuroinflammation and for remyelination. So we've got a series of catalysts coming over the next year. Uh, data out of the Hemophilia A program, uh, as well as we expect uh, movement forward with our partner Pfizer. Data out of the very preliminary data out of the ST400 program around year end and much more mature data uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, the sickle cell program with Sanofi, uh, they're enrolling that study. We look to KITE to initiate the, uh, uh, the first KITE 037 program uh, in CAR-T, and we'll be initiating the TX200 study, uh, filing that CTA this year and being in the clinic next year. And then at the end of next year, we'll be reinitiating our in vivo genome editing programs using some of the learnings that we picked up uh, along the way with AAV6. So what I want to leave you with is a sense of how fundamentally changed Sangamo is now. This is a company that is a genomic medicine company. We operate in four technology platforms. We have really good technology for editing and great capabilities there. We have a broad portfolio of product candidates. Some of them are pursuing rare diseases. Some of them are pursuing highly prevalent diseases. And it's across therapeutic area. I think it's diversified by risk profile. And it's also diversified by financing vehicles. Some of it we take forward. Some of it partners take forward. We have a flow of clinical data this year and next. And then we have a strong balance sheet, $450 million at the end of June. And we've got four strong partnerships advancing products. We also, and I didn't talk about this, but we've got new manufacturing capabilities at our new headquarters in Brisbane, California, right by the airport in San Francisco. And that'll be GMP ready in 2020. And you should all come visit us there. Thank you.